I'd be brave if you're brave I'd be brave but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest Together And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Lung Cancer Living Room. We're so excited to see all of you here in the room. It's a full, full house. People still coming in. Welcome, welcome. Uh, welcome to all of you online who might be watching, hopefully from a cozy spot uh, in your home, curled up somewhere and ready for uh, some exciting conversation. For those of you who don't know me, I am Danielle Hicks. Uh, my role here at the foundation is to oversee uh, anything and everything that really has a patient touch, so support, education, uh, that sort of thing is my area of responsibility. I, of course, do not do it alone. We have an entire organization dedicated uh, to, to patients and, and obviously other things, but patients are our priority. So that's who I am. I do want to jump into the topic. To my uh, left here is Dr. Uh, Donald Abrams, who you've heard referred to. I think Jane uh, mentioned his name a couple times. He's an integrative oncologist, immediate past chief of hematology and oncology at Zuckerberg San Francisco General. I remember when it was just San Francisco General. Um, and integrative oncology, UCSF Osher Cancer Center for Integrative Medicine and professor of clinical medicine at UCSF. And then to his immediate left is Susan Smedley, who is um, not only the uh, manager here at GoTo of our grassroots endurance events, but she is a survivor herself who has um, been incorporating this integrative type of care um, in her life for quite a while now. So we wanted her to be able to share some, some of her experiences and um, how it has uh, Im impacted her, uh, her, her journey, I guess. I hate calling it a journey. I need another word mm -hmm. yeah. since, um, since, right. her, since right. her original right. diagnosis. But I want to jump in first and ask Dr. Abrams just to kind of give a high-level overview of what integrative medicine is. What does it mean? Sure. So first of all, I do want to thank everybody for sharing mm -hmm. those stories. I was really impressed by everybody's courage, uh, intelligence, and articulateness. And I must say that I uh, just went to my own primary care provider uh, last week, pre-retirement, I thought I should check things out. <laughs> and I quit smoking for the second time 28 years ago. And uh, he ordered a chest x-ray. And I didn't hear about it for two days. And scanxiety, I mean, I was absolutely crazy because it didn't appear in the chart. And so I figured, oh my God, so he's gonna, anyway. So your bravery and courage also resounds quite heavily. So integrative medicine is the rational, evidence-informed combination of conventional therapy with complementary therapies. It's relationship-based and patient-centered. When I see a new patient at the Osher Center, I start out by saying, tell me your story. Very similar to the stories you told, and I listen. The average physician waits 17 seconds before interrupting the patient's first comments. So I listen. Actually, we get rated on our performance, and my lowest score is doctor knows my history, because I say, tell me your story. So now I've sort of changed, and when a new patient comes, I read a little bit in the chart, and I say, oh, I see you have lung cancer, and it was diagnosed. So it looks like a little bit, 
but it's very important for me to hear the story from the person so I understand how it impacts their life. Often I say, tell me your story, and they hand me a sheath of lab results or x-rays. I said, no, that's not your story. Or the spouse starts, starts <clears throat> to tell me the story, and that tells me the story. But uh, you know, it's relationship-based and patient-centered, and it's evidence-informed. Modern medicine is very much evidence-based. Andrew Weil, who's sort of my teacher, always said the degree of evidence should be directly proportional to the potential for the intervention to do harm. So if I say I'm going to give you a new chemotherapy and your hair is going to fall out and you're going to vomit for three days and your bone marrow is going to be suppressed, you would like to see some evidence. But if I say eat more broccoli and blueberries and get a massage twice a month, how much evidence do I really need I mean, to generate? <laughs> huh? Okay. You know, so... And how did I get to this? Let me just say that at the beginning of my training to be an oncologist at UCSF, suddenly AIDS came out of the blue, and we didn't know what it was or what to do about it. And I became a champion of alternative therapies when there was no conventional therapy to be alternative to. And then when we got our first conventional therapy, something called AZT, some of you might remember, I said, oh, this isn't very good. So I wrote all the chapters in all the AIDS textbooks on complementary and alternative therapies. And then in 1992, somebody challenged me to study cannabis as a treatment for the AIDS wasting syndrome. And I said, okay, I can do that. I went to college in the 60s. So I fought the government and ultimately won and got marijuana and money to do research, which gave me a strong appreciation of the power of plants as medicine, which then took me to the Telluride Mushroom Festival in Telluride, Colorado, a month after I'd done my first ever jury duty and came home and said, I want to go to law school. But in Telluride, I met Andrew Weil with the white beard, and he described a two-year online distance learning fellowship you could do with his program at the University of Arizona in integrative medicine. So I said, uh-huh, I don't want to go to law school. I want to do that. So I did, and it changed my life. When I finished, I said, I'm done with HIV AIDS. What I want to do now is integrative oncology, working with people living with and beyond cancer and helping them to integrate these other modalities into their conventional care. I can't really do that at San Francisco General Hospital, or we do call it Zuckerberg. Uh, <laughs> Zuckerberg. Because as I often say, for most of my patients, their cancer is really the least of their problems. They're homeless, they have substance abuse issues, mental health issues, or they're undocumented. So I can't really talk to them about eating organic or doing yoga because they have much more basic needs. So I went to our UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Medicine and asked, can I just do a half-day clinic here and see if I like it? And it quickly became my favorite half day. And now I have two half day clinics and I also do group visits at the cancer center. So what I say is at San Francisco General, I treat cancer and at the Osher Center, I treat people living with cancer. And I tell them cancer is like a weed and other people are taking care of your weed and it's my job to work with the garden and make your soil as inhospitable as possible to growth and spread of the weed. So I'm not really talking about weed killers, I'm talking about fertilizers, and that leads me into a conversation about nutrition and supplements. So yeah, so nutrition is pretty important. Uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association looks at the burden of U.S. disease from 1990 to 2016, and dietary risks is the number one cause of both morbidity and mortality in the United States today, surpassing tobacco smoking, uh, hypertension, and not including obesity and uh, low physical activity. If you put all those together, that's an amazing figure. And the CDC suggests that 40% of all cancer in the United States today is related to overweight or obesity. So obviously nutrition is very important in keeping our weight stable. What I do is I follow the guidelines from the American Institute for Cancer Research, World Cancer Research Fund. They're guidelines for reducing the risk of cancer but number 10 says for cancer survivors, follow the nine guidelines above. So number one is to be a healthy weight, and number two is a way to do that, and that is to be physically active. The guidelines changed from 07 to 2018 when they renewed them. In 07, they said be physically active for 30 minutes a day, which I think is much better. Now it says move more and sit less, which I think is not very useful. And then the next guideline is the first that says anything about food. And in 2007, it said 
avoid sugary drinks. So I was at the microphone in Bethesda when they unveiled that as a new guideline, and I said, there are sugary drinks and there are sugary drinks. You can drink a cola beverage, God forbid, or a fruit punch, which is probably glucose and high fructose corn syrup, or you can squeeze three oranges in the morning. And the response from the podium was, energetically, they're all the same. So I had lunch with Robert Lustig, who's the uh, pediatric endocrinologist at UCSF who fights the war on sugar. And he told me, when you eat an orange, the fiber slows down the absorption of sugar into the bloodstream. If you squeeze the sugar away from the fiber, it's like drinking a soft drink. So why is that bad? When the body sees that sugar, it responds with insulin, an insulin-like growth factor, both of which promote inflammation and the growth factor is a growth factor for cancer cells as well, to the point where we started looking at blockade of insulin-like growth factor one receptor as a treatment for a number of cancers. So does it mean I don't squeeze my three oranges? I used to do it every day. Now I just do it twice a week. But I get concerned about my patients who think I have cancer, I'm gonna juice everything. I say the diet should be whole foods. We need that fiber. And when you juice like that, those blades are actually destroying some of the plant nutrients that you're trying to get more of. This year, a new guideline says avoid fast foods. So they really called out fast foods. And again, that's to keep weight stable. Plus, foods that are high in fat, refined carbohydrates, and sugar are very satiating, but for a short time, and they encourage us to eat more. So fast foods were called out. The positive guideline is to eat more of a variety of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And I ask my patients to concentrate on cruciferous vegetables, flowers that grow in the shape of a crucifix. Hmm. So broccoli, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts jump to mind, but there are also cruciferous roots, radishes, parsnips, and green leafies, cabbage, kale, collard green, bok choy, and arugula. These all contain a chemical so potent reducing the risk of cancer that we've started to look at it as chemotherapy. So I believe we can never eat enough cruciferous vegetables. And I eat broccoli, tofu, and rice for breakfast. My other breakfast is mochi, which is just pounded brown rice. Puff it up in the oven, smear almond butter, and put a sweet potato on top of it. Because orange yellow vegetables are very good for you, especially lung cancer. The beta carotene in those vegetables uh, seem to reduce the risk. That's why they once did a study of beta carotene supplements found out that the supplement actually increased the risk. And that is guideline number eight, is to don't use supplements to protect against cancer, but we'll talk more about that. Mm -hmm. Number five uh, says limit consumption of red meat. And it used to say avoid processed meats, but this year they changed it to limit consumption of red and processed meat. And I think that's incorrect because the World Health Organization considers processed meats, bacon, salami, bologna, ham, sausage, hot dogs, anything you put on a pizza, as a class one carcinogen, no doubt about it. And those processed meats are contributing to lung cancer diagnoses. So red meat, I don't believe beef or pork are ever gonna be clean, and the only red meat I'll eat is lamb, because I picture it on the hills of Sonoma or New Zealand running free. And I only eat lamb maybe once a week on Sunday. I'm pretty much vegan until dinner time, and that's when I eat animals. Because I think as a culture, we eat too many animals. Those are saturated fat. And another animal product I'm not particularly fond of that's not in the guidelines is dairy. There's no other animal that drinks another species' milk. But no other animal drives a car or goes to college either, so that's not a very good argument. But no animal drinks milk after they've been weaned. And by the age of three or four, we lose the ability to digest the sugars and the proteins in dairy. We make a big deal about fat, low fat, no fat, 2%. It's not the fat. If you want a dairy product, butter is best because it's mainly fat. We talk about lactose intolerance as if it's a disease or a disorder, when in fact it's the norm and the ability to digest lactose is a genetic mutation on the second chromosome found mainly in Scandinavians who needed to digest reindeer milk in times of freeze. The rest of us, especially Asians, are all lactose intolerant, and we don't know until we stop. So then people always say, what about yogurt? So yogurt, 
as long the bacteria have already digested the sugars and the proteins. So as if you need a dairy product, butter, because it's mainly fat, or yogurt or kefir, as long as they're not artificially flavored, artificially colored, and with added sugar. What is kefir? Kefir is liquid yogurt, yeah. Mm. So sugar is the number one no. And my colleagues at the cancer center say to me all the time, why do you tell all of our patients that cancer loves sugar? And I say, what's a PET scan? How many here have had a PET scan? And what do they inject you with? Radio labeled sugar. And where does it go? To the cancer, because cancer needs sugar for energy. It doesn't use oxygen. So sugar is the number one no. Now, the last guideline that I'm going to touch on on nutrition, unfortunately, is about alcohol. It used to say in 2007, if consumed at all, limit alcohol to two a day for men and one a day for women. And I reached an age about five years ago where I can't tolerate alcohol anymore. It makes, disturbs my sleep, and in the morning I can't even look at myself in the mirror. And so I just stopped drinking, and it's amazing how mainstreamed alcohol is in our culture. My little brother's a diesel mechanic in Detroit, and he said, oh, Donald, if you go out with people and don't drink, they think you're a recovering alcoholic. So they changed the guideline this year because they appreciate that 6% of all cancer in the United States today is related to alcohol consumption. And it says for cancer prevention, no alcohol is best. So that's nutrition. So I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So, yeah, what do you want to say? So um, OK, so when we're talking about nutrition, you're talking about a lot of these the like, kefir. I didn't know what that was, and some of the other things. I love the crucifix sort of analogy <laughs> with it because that no, helps that's what, me. That's where the word yeah, comes from. Yeah, I get it. That yeah. helps me understand what what kind of vegetables are. <laughs> so when we're working with the patient who maybe is on chemotherapy and it's affecting their taste buds and their oh, appetite yeah. and like all of those things, what maybe are the recommendations there? when it's really about what they're tolerating versus to, sure. to keep weight on. You know, and the American Cancer Society used to say, if you're getting chemotherapy, eat angel food cake and milkshakes. And I said, no, that's wrong. Rebecca Katz is a dear friend. And she, she spoke here. She writes Cancer Fighting Kitchen, mm -hmm. and she has FAS, F-A-S-S, -S, fat, acid, sugar, no, no, sweet, and sour. And she tells you if food tastes like cardboard, add a drop of this, the maple syrup, or the lemon. And her fast, she has it as a postcard too, so you can, I give it to my patients so they can uh, put it up in their kitchen when they're getting those taste disorders from their chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's, I think, the best thing to do. I mean, you know, I tell my patients, these are my guidelines to keep your soil as inhospitable as possible to growth and spread of the weed. But if you go out and you're eating berries, for example, that are not organic, you're not gonna fall over dead. So heavily pigmented <laughs> fruits, by the way, and apples particularly good for lung cancer, quercetin in mm -hmm. the apples. Yes. I have a question about the colored yogurt. I, what if berries are in the yogurt? Yeah, Does so, that count as a color? Yeah, I would put your own berries in because if you look at those yogurts that have berries. So when I say no sugar, if you look on the nutrition facts box on any processed foods, it's OK to have sugars in the nutrition facts box. That sugar fuels our brain. Where I don't want to see sugar, and a nickname for sugar is in the ingredients list. Sugar attached to fiber is fine, eating fruit. We should have four and a half cups of fruits and vegetables each day, more vegetables than fruits. So with that, I want to go, because Dr. Abrams did touch on something um, that I was saving for Susan, and that is to um, talk a little bit about exercise. He mentioned 30 minutes, I think, a day um, is what they're saying. And for lung cancer patients in particular, that can be a challenge because their, their lungs, their lung capacity is compromised, right? And so getting any sort of what one might deal real exercise is, is um, not always an option. But Susan um, has some information and some things that she wants to share with us about how she's incorporated a more low impact, type of exercise and the benefits of it um, and share, what well, do you want to share? Yeah, yeah. So um, I was, um, I first came into looking at um, 
the world of mind, body, and wellness in my 20s, actually. Um, I had been working as a social worker um, on the front lines, worked um, at a rape crisis center in Chicago, and um, talk about stress, you know, was carrying the beeper, the whole deal that tells you how long ago it was. Um, <laughs> and um, over the course of a couple years, I started having um, different body symptoms, right? I was basically burning out and didn't realize it at the time. By the time I was 25, I was in um, total, what they would call now adrenal fatigue. Um, I was diagnosed with um, chronic fatigue syndrome and basically was told, um, you know, we can give you antidepressants and that's about it. Well, I changed my garden. I, I pulled back from doing that kind of work um, and my symptoms didn't get better and um, actually I started having breathing issues and um, wheezing and um, had x-rays, they came back clear. Fast forward a couple of years, um, when I was pregnant, I coughed up blood, and um, you know that was the first sign that something might be might be off. Um, but X-rays kept coming back clear. Um, throughout this period of time, I started looking outside of allopathic medicine and started seeing um, an acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist, and she was really treating me as a person. You know, um, I had a couple of diagnoses, um, but she really was wanted to know my story, wanted to know when all this had started and um, follow the trail that way. And um, from that point forward, I really credit her with saving my life um, because when the inhalers weren't working for my asthma, and um, some of the other things that were prescribed for me, um, she started doing cupping on some points on my back. And I credit that with saving my life because um, I started coughing up copious amounts of blood. And um, then we were sort of forced to look past the stigma of I'm 32 years old, I'm healthy, and she can't have lung cancer to where they did a bron bronchoscopy and found that I, in fact, had lung cancer and... Um, and they never took a CT. Never took a CT, mm -hmm. no. Um, so this was 23 years ago. I'm incredibly lucky, obviously, to be here. Um, and, you know, the, the interest that I have had, certainly back then, it led to an early diagnosis. Um, but it also never left me that it was very much connected to the stress that my body and my my spirit was under. You know, mm. I was I was basically um, living in um, a state of constant fight or flight. Um, certainly professionally, but then you know, previous to that, um, I had had a pretty <clears throat> traumatic childhood. So when you look at you know, the, the previous 10 years, um, and then I started developing symptoms, I read Louise Hay's book, um, Heal Your Body, where she has found um, the body of thought that certain symptoms or diseases are connected to um, emotional states and experiences. And um, before I was ever even diagnosed, I started looking at that book. So when I was diagnosed, it didn't completely shock me because I saw that it was sort of part of my larger life. And I didn't, I didn't see it as being um, blaming myself, like, oh, I caused this. I saw it as I'm not just a group of symptoms that needs to be treated by someone outside of myself, that I can participate in my own healing, you know? so. I didn't just say, I'm going to heal myself. Don't get me wrong. I went and had a thoracotomy and, you know, <laughs> um, followed doctor's orders. At the same time, I looked at what can I be doing to tend to my own garden and to listen to my own wisdom. And um, I have continued to follow that trail forward because we shouldn't be living from scan to scan to find out, can we live? We, we absolutely can live, and as, um, as I have 
progressed, um, I've come to yoga. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after having um, the better part of one lung removed, I, I couldn't run anymore and I couldn't be an athlete until a friend of mine said, Susan, I'm a breast cancer survivor. Come join um, Team Survivor and let's do a triathlon. And I kept telling myself I can't do it. And the truth is I could do it. I was slow. I trained. We did a sprint triathlon. And I just went slow. And I finished that race. And I'm, I was a different person after that because I changed what I was telling myself I could and couldn't do what we're telling ourselves we're capable of. And it doesn't mean you have to run a marathon, certainly not as fast as Jason did, but <laughs> we get to decide um, what we want to do. And it may not be your thing to run a marathon, mm -hmm. but let's look at what we can do. And yoga has really um, spoken to me on a variety of ways from a trauma perspective. I mean, getting a cancer diagnosis explodes your life and explodes the lives of everyone that loves you. And, you know, there are stress hormones that are connected to living with this sort of diagnosis. And every time we're waiting for a scan, that gets reactivated in our bodies. And so we need to get that out. And one of the ways that um, we can do that is through intentional breathing. And if we have time, I would like to actually demonstrate that to you so you all leave here with a tool that you can use anywhere at any time including in the infusion chair including as you're driving when you're standing in line somewhere so are you all game for for that to walk away with the tool okay great so what i'd like you to do is sit forward <clears throat> And just move around a little bit. We've been, you know, we've been sitting for a while. And press your feet into the floor, okay? And if you feel comfortable, I invite you to either blink your eyes closed or send them down on, um, to the floor in front of you to find what we call a soft gaze. And what we're doing is we're starting to bring our awareness inward a little bit. And I'd, I invite you to take your hands and place them on your low belly. And what we're first going to do here is just press your low belly out and then draw it back in. So really send it out on an inhale like a, like a big fat belly. And on your exhale, draw it back in. And let's start to slow down our breath here, inhaling through the nose as we press the belly out for four, three, two, one. Exhale, draw it back in for five, four, three, two, one. Send the crown of your head up as you inhale. Pressing the belly out. Exhale, let your shoulders drop as you draw the belly in. Take several more with your count. Really drawing breath up your straightened spine. Exhale, drawing the belly back in. Several more here. Okay, last round here. And then slowly blink the eyes open. Maybe move around a little bit. So there were a couple key points to that breath. Number one was you want to um, not be slouching, right? Because we want to open up the chest. We want to send the crown of the head up 
to straighten the spine, okay? We also want to inhale and exhale through the nose if you can, okay? And then we, we're sending the low belly out. What we're doing is we're working our belly like a bellows, right, with a fire. And what we're trying to do here is to activate the vagus nerve. And it's the largest nerve that runs throughout our body. And when we move our belly out and in, we're activating the vagus nerve. And what that does is it sends a signal to the brain to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest nervous system. The opposite is the sympathetic or the fight, flight, or freeze. What we wanna do is we wanna get out of that state of anxiety, of fear, of gripping. And we can't talk ourselves out of that, you know, because it's a mental state. The answer is in the body. So we use our breath to basically hijack the nervous system to click into the calm and it releases the calming hormones. I mean, do you feel any different from before we did the breathing? And that's, that's the power of those calming hormones. Mm -hmm. And the way that we do it is through the breath. There's a lot of different breath practices that, that you can find online. There are several resources um, available. There is a whole world, 5,000 mm -hmm. years of yoga mm -hmm. and pranayama or breath practices um, that are designed to help people navigate life and to use the body to help clear the mind. And um, you don't have to be, we don't have to be a slave to our thoughts. We are not our thoughts. We are not our symptoms. We are not our diagnoses. We are far more than that. And when we're able to use our breath, we create that pause to then recognize that we are not our thoughts. And I encourage you to educate yourself about other, um, other practices that are available to you and try different things um, because it doesn't have to be up to something outside of yourself. You have the power to calm your mind mm -hmm. and calm your body and really tend to that garden. And Susan, th there's another, um, there's two separate documents on the tables in front of you. One, uh, the other one, we already talked about one, the other one, um, Susan kind of outlined some of the things that, um, that she's uh, privy to that have been helpful for her. So anything from online videos, like she said, to mobile applications and those sort of things that, that you guys can um, check out on your own if you're interested. This has been a really um, um, fascinating conversation for me. I don't... I don't, you know, know that everything is going to resonate with everyone in the room, but I'm what I'm hoping, or or anyone or everyone online, but what I'm hoping is that bits and pieces that picked up will resonate with you, and you will want to dig deeper and learn more about how some of this integrative type of medicine, if you will, will help um, you uh, on a on a personal level in a way that that works for you. So. I want to give a huge thank you to Dr. Abrams and to Susan for coming and talking um, with us today about what is going on in this space right now, today, in real time, and how it can benefit you. Oh, I'll be brave if you're brave. I'll be brave, but only if you're brave And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see So I will fight if you'll fight Yeah, I will fight, but only if you'll fight Oh, we can make it through this Like sailors in a tempest Like sailors in a tempest 
together And it could be Just you and me We'll be family Just wait and see